Oh my, what a beautiful spring day it is today. And it's a perfect day to get out and explore. And that's what I'm doing. I'm on an, or in an area on a trail, barely, as such as it is already, I've been off trail a few times for this reason. This is not an area I've been to very often. In fact, I've only been here once before, a couple of years ago. And it's an area I don't think very many other people go to either, which is significant considering today's topic. Today's topic is about safety, being safe while you're out here in the woods. And that is spe specifically or especially applies to areas you're not familiar with, but we'll get to the reasons why in a few minutes time. So I packed light because I didn't expect to do a whole lot of uh, testing and things like that. I won't be building a wood fire. I do have a nice stove and pot combination I'll be using, but that'll be for making my tea and coffee. I will be having coffee, of course. So yeah, I'm in an area I'm not all that familiar with. I've already <laughs> encountered a couple of blowdowns from the winter, a couple of which I've been able to get around, one of which I did have to saw, but there was just no getting around of it. So it was, at least I'm glad I brought my saw. I didn't think I'd need it for anything else, but that's the reason you take it sometimes is for the things you don't anticipate. Again, back to the topic of the day. All right, so I'm going to explore, find a site where I can set up and make some coffee, have some lunch, and we'll have a discussion around being safe in the woods. Follow along. All right, question of the day. This is lungwort. Lungwort is one of the lichens in the classification folios. Folios is one of three classifications for lichens. And uh, it's kind of unique for a couple of reasons. I'm going to give you one, but I want you to give me the other. So the one reason is it is a good indicator of health of the woods. And the reason is, is because any of the lichens in the folios class are fir affected first by air pollution. So seeing this here tells me that the area that I'm in is relatively pollution free. Now I've seen healthier and larger lungwort as well. So it could be a not the best example. If I find another one, I'll add it into the video. But that's the giveaway for one of the things. Now the other, I'll give you a hint and you give me the rest. It's what it looks like and what it resembles. All right, if you can tell me that, then uh, put your, your answer in the comment section below. And my water is just about to a boil. Probably have just enough time to get my coffee ready. So I did go ahead and have my lunch and didn't share that with you. I apologize. Just a couple of hard boiled eggs. Nothing special. I wanted to make sure we had enough time for our discussion. So that's why I jumped ahead to the making of the coffee. And simple pour over device. Hard to beat a simple pour over device especially if you have good coffee with it, which is, as usual, Rampage, ground this morning. Maybe a little bit more than that. Not quite three full scoops. Check my water. Close, but not quite. Actually, I was a little faster than I thought. But I know this stove won't... Oh, maybe if I turn it up a little bit. Noisy, isn't it? That's the Fire Maple Hornet 2 titanium ultralight stove. Great stove, fast. When you turn it... Oh yeah, there we go. Now we're boiling. But if you... Uh, it's noisy. Yeah, boiling hard. Turn it off altogether. Yeah, I guess I turned it on, put the pot on, and didn't turn it up. So I'm just letting it kind of cool for half a second. So the pot I'm using is my Fire Maple Petrol. Nice little pot. And I'm going to try something with it. It has these three little uh, vent holes in them. I guess they could also be strainer holes. I'm going to see if it'll work for pouring water in my pour, pour over. And it does. <laughs> Not as well as a dedicated kettle. but it's working and give it a little bit of a soak. Yeah, 
There we are, that's the soak time. Just a slow pour. Around and around we go. Make sure all the coffee gets wet and mixed in. Yeah, I guess it does offer me a little bit more control than if I was just trying to pour it off of the edge of the pot. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> All right. I wouldn't call this the best way to pour water for pour over coffee. And that should be all it takes, right there. I want the sides to collapse. All right, nothing more to do until wait until the coffee's poured through and then we'll start our discussion. All right, let's start with a taste test of the coffee. Perfect, can't beat the Rampage coffee. Just a little hot, I'd give it a little bit more time to cool down. All right, topic of the day, safety while you're out here in the woods. Now, the background for this topic came from one of my viewers, Martin Reeves, who asked in the comment section of a previous video for me to share what I take out as safety equipment. So thank you, Martin, for the suggestion. But honestly, it got involved. I started to consider about the things I do take out into the woods. And, you know, every time I come out, I start from scratch. I pack whatever bag I'm taking out, and that's the first thing. It may, may not always be the same bag. So I want to start from scratch packing it so I know exactly what's going into my bag, where it is, and making sure I'm familiar with it. That way I don't miss anything. It gets all too easy to just leave things in your bag and go out with them every time and not consider about, you know, consider are they the right ones for you to take with you that day. So how do you know what is the right things to take with you when you go out into the woods? Well, there actually is a process that you can apply to making those decisions. And it turns out I actually have a lot of experience and training in this area, not specifically for the woods, but for another area altogether. For the last nine years of my career as a police officer, I was assigned to work with the Department of Education and my responsibilities included school safety and security for all the schools across our province, including emergency planning. So I would help design the emergency plans for the schools. The schools would do the work. I would just lend my expertise and they would build their emergency plans around a certain set of criteria, which I gave to them to apply. So what is that criteria? Well, people in the industry of safety and security will know what it's all about. It's known as risk assessment and emergency planning or preparation, both terms apply here. So it starts with a risk assessment. Basically a risk assessment is you asking yourself, what could possibly go wrong while I'm out here in the woods? And if it does go wrong, how serious is it? Now you can be just that uh, low level with it, that, that casual about it, or you can actually formalize it a little bit. And it, maybe it's a good exercise, at least the first time you go out, or the first few times, is to actually write it down. What can go wrong while I'm out here? And what could happen if it does go wrong? Now, there are a number of factors to take into consideration, like where are you going? Now, if you're going just into the local woods, not that far from home, you have good cell coverage, you're not going to be all day, uh, then that's one thing. But if you're going on a multi-day trip into the backwoods with no contact with people, that's another scenario altogether and it will make a great difference of, in terms of what you take with you. Another aspect of it is, is when what time of the year specifically. It's a huge difference. Right now it's a beautiful spring day. Uh, the coldest it's going to get it tonight is probably just above zero. I did bring a little puffy vest. I thought it might be a little cooler. It's not. It turns out to be beautiful. But I have that. If I did get stuck out here, I have a little bit of extra warmth. But if this was midwinter, I'd have to be prepared for staying overnight, even if it wasn't my intention to do so, and the cold that can go along with it. So when you're where you're going when you're going and what are you doing when you get there and this is the part that changes for me just about every time as i mentioned when i opened this video up today was a scouting hike i was going on a trail that i haven't been on in a few years time i wanted to see if it would lead me into some new areas it was an enjoyable hike um, there was a lot of down trees. I think I mentioned that earlier. It ended up at a, sp a place which I come to quite often. It was just a another way of getting there. But I'm going to take that trail more often because I think there may be some more things to see in there that I, maybe I haven't shown you before. But in doing that, I was not able to accurately predict all the things that might happen to me. I mean, generally I could. I could fall. I could trip. I could get a poke in the eye with a stick. Any number of things like that. But 
it was an area that I wasn't really familiar with. And that is when you really want to go through this risk assessment exercise to ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong? And how serious would it be if it does? Now, if you want to be formal about it, you can actually create a chart and categorize everything on a one to five. One to five, how likely it is. If it's a one in likelihood, then it's not something you have to be considered too worried about unless it also the impact of it happening happens to be a five. So if you understand what I mean, if it's not very likely to happen and the impact is very low, you would have a one and a one. So it's a low impact thing. You can probably drop that to the bottom of your list. You don't ignore it. You just drop it to the bottom of your list. However, if it's something that's very likely to happen and the impact could be very serious, a five and a five, you really want to focus in on those things. So what would a one and a one be? I missed my lunch. Oh, well, not very much of a big deal at all. But a five and a five could be I'm working with saws and axes and sharp things. And if I cut myself severely, then I and I'm far enough back in the woods, I could be in serious trouble. I really need to pay attention to that risk. And what can I do? Now, here's where we go. What can I do to prevent it from happening? Or if I can't totally prevent it from happening, what can I do to mitigate or lessen the impact of it? And that's what it's all about. Prevention and mitigation. So. That's where we get into this. Now, the other half of the emergency plan is you're, you work on prevention and mitigation, but then you also work on response and recovery. Response is, what are you gonna do if it actually does happen? And the recovery is, what lessons did you learn from this, provided you survive the incident, of course. What lessons did you learn or maybe you could learn these lessons from somebody else that shared an incident with you on YouTube or a friend so that you can learn from that and then circle back to, is that something I might face as a risk? If it is, how serious is it? If it happens, what can I do to prevent it? What can I do to lessen the impact if I can't prevent it? And how am I gonna to respond to it if it does happen? That's the whole mystique, if you will, of emergency planning. It takes time, and for some applications out here, most of us have enough of an intuitive knowledge of what can go wrong that we know what to do to prevent it and to how to mitigate it. So that's the process. Oh, I gotta interject here for a moment. Just a moment ago, I gave the credit for this video to Martin Reeves, and I was incorrect in stating that um, I actually could not find the comment from the viewer that asked me to do this video on uh, safety equipment. But Martin Reeves is somebody who was the first person to answer a question of the day from the last video. So the question in that video was, I had shown uh, some um, jack pine trees and I had mentioned that the pine cones will only release their seeds when the ambient air temperature exceeds 50 degrees Celsius. And I asked, how does that happen? And the answer is forest fire. So when a forest fire occurs, that's when pine, uh, the jack pines will regenerate by dropping their seeds and they're the first ones. Some, somebody told me they're called fire pines as a nickname for that reason. But jack pine is the name I know it by. Martin Rees was the first, but he wasn't the only. Actually, there was a lot of people who got that one right. It surprised me a little bit. I didn't think it was that common knowledge, but yes, Fire, forest fire is what causes the jack pine to release its seeds to generate the next generation of themselves. All right, let's move on. All right, let's get specific in terms of what do you actually want to take. And I will in a minute show you what I did bring out today. But even in these specifics, there are a few comprehensive principles that will help you decide what you need to take out. So the first thing that you're going to take with you is your knowledge, your skills, your experience, and your fitness. Don't underestimate any of those things. If you were weak in certain areas and it is the thing that would have been most helpful to you, now, before you go, now's the time to work on it. A good example of that is first aid. So if you don't have good first aid or up-to-date first aid training, now is the time to get it. Don't think that a first aid kit is going to work for you if you don't have training to support how it is supposed to be used. All right, that's number one. Now, there are others I could give you example as your knife skills. Um, there are certain things we know that are safe to do and certain things we know that are unsafe to do with a knife, an ax, or a saw. Those come from knowledge, you may get them from experience. Let's just hope your experience wasn't a bad one and that's how you learned it. So pay attention to all the things by, in terms of your knowledge, your skills, 
your experience and your fitness. Don't underestimate your physical fitness in terms of it being a safety thing for you. Now, a couple of other general principles that you can consider, and I borrow these from Dave Canterbury. And Dave Canterbury came up with the uh, an acronym, the five C's of survivability. And yes, I know there's an expanded called the 10 C's of survivability, but we're only gonna start with the five C's. Now, this is, this is just a general principle. You still have to apply this to your situation of the, any given day that you're going out. So what are those five C's, of course? Are a cutting tool, a combustion device, a cover element, a container, and cordage. Now, by that, by way of example, cutting tool, that can be anything from a pocket knife to an ax and a saw and a bushcraft knife. Those are all cutting tools. We'll get to why I said three things in a moment. Combustion device, that could be your uh, Bic lighter, which I have in my pocket. It could be your ferrocerium rod, which I have in my, another one of my pockets. Maybe you've decided to bring flint and steel. You're actually going to try bow drill and any type of uh, a friction fire. Um, those are all combustion devices, but you have to know that you can use them when you need them. All right, so those that's a good example. Cover element. Now, Dave Canterbury goes into this very well, and most people think in terms of cover as a tarp, a tent, some type of an element that covers you from the elements, and that's true but your cover element starts with what you're wearing. I'm wearing my Helicon Tex Woodsman Anorak today, which is up to the task. It's just cool enough that this is providing all the wind insulation, but if it gets windy and wet, this also gives me all the cover I need for the conditions of the day. A container. Now we're talking about a container to boil water in, but that's true, but I'm going to get come back to boiling or sterilizing water in a minute, but it's always a good idea that you have at least one type of container that you can actually put in a fire to sterilize water with. I actually have two, and I'll explain that in a moment. And the last thing is cordage. I think Ray Mears said when he puts together his uh, Billy Pot survival kit that he stuffs all the things in it, and he says, if you've got any room left in your survival kit, stuff it with cordage, because you may not think you'll need it, but you'll come up with a reason to use your cordage. So always have cordage with you, whether it's paracord, bank line, even, uh, I don't know, just some simple string. Cordage is useful more than you would think. So have your cordage with you. So those are just examples of the five C's. Now, if I'm going out overnight, going out in the winter for multiple days, that's gonna impact those choices in those things. Dave also has a little saying that he likes to make, which is, uh, two is one and one is none, meaning redundancies. If you've got one cutting tool, you should probably have a second cutting tool as a backup. Now you can have more than that, of course, but two is, uh, what is it? Two is, one is, two is one and one is none. So have backups to whatever it is. Now, that's also part of your risk assessment. I wasn't planning on doing any cutting, um, chopping or sawing or anything out here today. I was just planning on using my gas canister stove to cook up my lunch and make my coffee. I still have two cutting tools, actually three if I include my saw, and I mentioned the saw earlier. And uh, so I actually do have three cutting tools with me today. So it's always a good practice to have extras. I know weight, bulk is all a consideration, but match those things with your risks, as we talked about earlier. All right, so those are the general principles. So let's a uh, couple of examples, another drink of coffee. For some of us, that would be one of those things that you have to take with you, right, is your coffee, because without it, how would you survive, right? Okay, here's a good one, and this is probably, doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, but it's a, something as simple as a cell phone. I've got great cell phone coverage here. This wilderness area is kind of in the middle of the city. It's on the outskirts, and it's still, the, you know, I'm not that far away. I'm, I'm at no more than an hour away from civilization when I, when I come out here. So uh, I have good cell coverage, but if I'm going into an area that does not have good cell coverage, then I have to consider what's my alternative plan for that. Is it going to be a satellite phone or one of the satellite signaling devices that are becoming more Zolio, I think, and Spot? Those are a couple of them ones that can send message via satellite or can it hook to your phone to allow you to send tasks. I mean, there's all kinds of options Other technology is great that way. So you want to determine, do you have cell coverage? Now, I put communications right at the top of this list for a very specific reason. This comes from 36 years of police work and 15 years of paramedic work. When things go down the tubes, we'll say, it's always communications that suffers first. So you want to have your communications in place. In fact, your communications actually start before you leave home. 
and this is the preparation part. So the prevention and the mitigation. One of those things that you can do is let somebody know where you're going and what you're going to be doing and when you're going to be back because that right there may be enough to save your life or at least save you from severe injury because somebody knows to come looking for you at a specific time. So I mentioned the cell phone, a first aid kit. A first aid kit appropriate to what you're doing. Now there are days when I go up with just a haversack or just a satchel, a little bit bigger than a haversack, and I have no real plans to work with any cutting tools or anything else, I still take a first aid kit. It may not be as robust and have all the things in it that the one I brought out today has, but it will cover the little boo-boos and things like scraped knees, blisters between the toes or on the heels or anywhere, thing like that, uh, get something in the eye, uh, get a tick, I know how to get it out. I cover those things in my little first aid kit. Right? But however, today I brought out one that will comp uh, cover more comprehensive injuries such as serious bleeding. So I'll, I'll have a Cat5 tourniquet with me today just in case. And more important, I have the training to use them. And that's, I, I come back to that again because you can never say that much. Don't buy a first aid kit unless you know how to use what's inside of it. Take your training then get your first aid kit. It's, it's that order that you have to do it in. So that's first aid kits. Oh, right along with first aid kits is this, toiletry kit. And it could take, maybe it's just a, a roll of toilet paper and maybe a little hand sanitizer or something like that that you can stuff in your first aid kit if you have the room for it. Uh, yeah, when if you're caught out and you uh, get developed diarrhea because of something you ate or the water you drank, usually it won't happen that quickly, uh, you really appreciate having your toiletry kit with you. So some, if you're out overnight or longer, you're going to have a more expensive, extensive uh, toiletry kit. But if you're out just for a day, at least a little bit of toilet paper in your kit is a nice thing. Another thing that goes in your first aid kit, a lot of people don't think of, but just remember, it, what happens if you're stuck out? If you are on medications like heart medications, take them with you. Take them with you, even if they're not going to, you know, it's not within the time frame that you would normally use them. Take them with you, because if you are stuck out overnight for, or for a longer period of time, you know, that can make a big difference in your survivability if you take the medications that you have with you. Now, I, take, I don't have any prescription medications, but I do take things with me, like things for diarrhea, things for upset stomach, things for headaches and, and injuries. So I've got, you know, the common things that I would take with me uh, for most people could get just over the counter. So that's first aid kits covered. Okay, signaling devices. Now, I did mention the... Um, cell phone, but signaling devices, the more basic ones, the ones that we should have with you anyway, starts with a whistle. Now, you're not going to be using the whistle all the time, from the time you get lost until the time you get found. You're probably going to use the whistle when you think someone's close enough to hear it, but you've got to have it with you in order to use it. So a whistle. You could have a bright orange flag or an emergency blanket, something that can signal uh, helicopters overhead or search and rescue people coming through the woods. Each of those things are important to have. Uh, at least I always have a whistle. I don't have an emergency blanket with me today, do I? No, I don't. But I do have my whistle. So a whistle is on usually on the sternum strap or on the shoulder strap of all the bags I take with me. So, uh, and it differs. It differs to your situation again. And um, compass, map, or GPS. That was the next thing. Now, uh, my phone is my GPS if I need it, but I always have a compass. I have one in my pocket. I'll show it to you in a minute. I did not bring a map. Now, you're saying, well, what's the point of having a compass if you don't have a map? If I'm going into an area I don't know, Definitely, I need a map. If I'm going into an area I know a lot, I probably don't need a map, but I still take my compass. And it, this has happened to me, and it can happen, I think, to anybody. And that is, you think you know the area so well, but if you're not paying attention, you go down a little rabbit path or a deer path or something, and you're 10 or 15 minutes down that path, and all of a sudden you said, no, this is not the right path. And if you're not smart enough to backtrack until you figure out where it is you got off the path, you can be out there for an extended period of time. It happened to me a few years ago in an area I knew well, but as soon as I got off the path and going down the wrong one because I just wasn't paying attention, kind of following my feet, that's when I got into a, a spot of trouble. Now, serious trouble? No. I had my compass. I knew what my escape bearing was. I did have to do some bushwhacking to get back on the trail, but I knew well enough the territory that I knew if I followed my escape bearing on my compass that I could get to where I was going. If it was an area I did not know, I would definitely be using a map and maybe by GPS. I like to prefer the things that I know are not going to fail, map and compass. GPS is also a great thing to have, but map and compass 
doesn't fail, doesn't run out of batteries, right? Okay, that's enough of that. Water treatment. Okay, so there are different ways of looking at water treatment. I have, what did I bring with me today? No, I only brought one means of today because again, I wasn't anticipating it. But you can have chemical water treatments. They can work, but they don't usually cover all the risks that water may present. You can have mechanical water treatments, such as a filter, and some of the filters will cover everything that you were likely to encounter. And you can have thermal boiling your water. Boiling your water is your backup. That will always work. It won't remove, it'll kill all the organisms that are in it, but it won't remove things like heavy metals and other chemicals in it. That's only the right filter will do that, but at least it will kill the pathogens, the ones that are going to make you quick or sickest quickest anyway. So have, not I mentioned, I have two. I have the little pot that I use to make this coffee and I have a stainless steel water bottle with me. So I actually have two devices. The little pot it's not really suited for putting in a fire. The stainless steel water bottle, of course, is. So that's important. Um, spare socks. I didn't do that today because I was going light, but all winter long, I take a pair of spare wool socks and I have them in a little dry bag in the bottom of my bag. They're just one of the first things to go. It's way at the bottom. So it's out of the way because if you've ever gone through some ice and soaked your foot, then you appreciate having dry socks to change into. So socks can be considered. Today, did I need them? No, really, I didn't need them, so I just saved the space on that. If worst case scenario, if I did get wet today, it's warm enough, I'm not going to be, and I'm not that far away from uh, getting out of the woods that I would be really hampered by wet, sore feet. Uh, headlamp. I do have a headlamp. I have a headlamp and I take one all year long. I'll show you that in a minute. I have, I sometimes take a more robust one, one with a bigger battery in the winter time, but I have one here that I can use uh, if I'm stuck out over here tonight, or at least if I'm just late getting out of the woods. A headlamp or some type of a light. You know, headlamp is nice because your hands are free. Can you get by with a flashlight? Sure you can, but a headlamp is just that much better. Gloves and spare glasses. Now, gloves. I, I have some lightweight hiking gloves because it was quite cold when I came out this morning, but well, I'll, in a minute, I'll, again, I'll show you what I did bring up. I have leather gloves with me because I anticipated I might have to do some trail clearing. As I said, I did bring two knives. If I'm going to be working with sharp things or hot things, then leather gloves are an absolute. I always have those with me. I've paid the price of not having them with me and wished I had, and things with cuts and scrapes and burns. So having those gloves is just one of those things. They go with me if I'm going to be using anything sharp or making anything hot. All right, so that covers it. And there was one last thing I wanted, to, and then I'll get into specific. I said eyeglasses. All right, this came from experience just last trip out. And that is, these are considered my primary glasses. These go in my kit every time I go out to the woods, except for last time I came out. But I had a second pair in my first aid kit just in case, just for that reason. So the trip wasn't wasted. I didn't even realize until I got well into the woods that I had left these home. So it was nice to know that I had that backup spare pair of glasses. Could I have navigated the woods without them? Yeah, that's not the vision issue I have. Could I have made videos or read anything or looked at my phone? No, that's where I would have been in trouble. But I wouldn't have, I could have easily survived without the glasses, but man, they make a big difference when you need them you need them, so pack a spare pair of glasses because you never know. I actually broke a pair of these one day out here in the woods and it was nice to have a spare pair of glasses at that time as well. All right, what I'm gonna do is probably focus the camera just a little bit differently so I can show you what I brought in my backpack applicable to safety items. Let's start with another drink of coffee before it gets cold. You know, I've got some nice coffee cups. I've got some double wall titanium ones. I've got some uh, carved wooden cookses. I have a set of Kapilka ones, all nice stuff. I picked this up one time at a thrift store and it's from a Canadian company called Mountain Equipment Co-op. Uh, they're very similar to REI in the States. Actually, they're pretty much identical, all the same offerings, types of offerings anyway. And it's just a thick plastic mug with a sippy lid on it that you know, I don't know if I paid more than a dollar for it, but it works for me for, you know, if I'm looking for something a little lighter, a little bit more robust, and I'm not trying to test something new out. And it keeps my coffee warm. All right. All right, let's get started with my safety devices. So probably should show you what I have in my pockets. That would make more sense. So... Ferrocerium rod for my combustion device, and it is hooked on to my belt. Not the belt loop, but the belt itself. So that's in one pocket. 
put that away. And another pocket, a bit lighter, nice bright orange. I can actually still see through this to see how much, and it's still over halfway full, so that's good. And you wouldn't think of this as a, where's the compass? Here it is. This also is attached to my belt by a little lanyard, so there is my compass. You know, it goes with me every time. It's not often I need it, but when you need it, you need it, right? And I have, can, is that showing up? There is my belt knife. I have another belt or another knife in my pack, and I'm looking for one more thing here. You wouldn't think of this as an important safety item, but you know, it, it actually can be. This is uh, lip stuff that I would put on. This has a sun protection factor of 30. So um, yeah, you, you know, dry cracked lips or wintertime dry cracked lips from the cold and the dryness, you know, very uncomfortable to say the least. Sunscreen though, I can put this on my face if necessary. And most people would know that it also makes a great improvised fire lighter. This is the fuel, just needs some type of a wicking material, whether it's a cotton ball or a piece of, uh, I don't know, old man's beer off of the tree, usne off the tree. This will make great fire lighter. But for me, it's more about its intended purpose, we'll say. And let me put that away in this pocket on me. So I'm showing you the items on me for a reason. If I get separated from my backpack for whatever reason, let's say I fell through the ice or just fell into the water and I had to dump the pack in a hurry to make sure that I could at least get to shore, then I want to have items in my pocket so that I can count on for use. But at the same time, a lot of my stuff is in the backpack. Uh, stretch a cord. This is uh, a six foot piece of paracord with a bowling lo lo uh, loop on one end of it. Quite often it's used for hanging my backpack from the uh, tree or something like that, but I've used it for grabbing, well, pulling wood together or dragging things or, yeah, there's any number of reasons to have a little piece of cordage in your pocket. Now let's go to the backpack. So the backpack I have today, as I said, I'm moving light and fast, so I didn't take a big pack out. This is my Sarma CP15 that I've reviewed separately. It has the side pouches on it and everything. Right off the top, what do you see right there, right? First aid kit. Now, yes, people have mentioned you can get first aid kits that rip right off, and they would be great. And I might get one of those one day. This one still works with the molly straps and has snaps underneath, so I can still unsnap it very quickly and run with it to someone that is in need, but more than likely it's me because I'm out here by myself. That's another factor. Are you by yourself? If you're by yourself, you have to consider, I don't have anybody to help me. I have to be self-reliant and take that into consideration. All right, there is my first aid kit. This is the one I take out with me most often. It has everything to cover all the major injuries and things that could be life-threatening inside of here. I have larger first aid kits. Why do I need a larger first aid kit? I'm a hike leader. I take groups of up to 20 people out, myself and another hike leader. You want larger for, um, first aid kits to cover injuries that you can anticipate, likely, especially with people not well experienced in the, in the woods. So there's my first aid kit ready and available. There is my leather gloves, as mentioned. They are on the outside of my pack. And on this side of my pack and this pocket is my Diet Design stainless steel Nalgene hiker model, the one with the tapered end on it. That's my, I've had that in the fire before. It works just great, but that's all the water I needed. And also on the outside of the pack, and there is my whistle, as mentioned, attached to my sternum strap on the backpack there. So those are what's on the outside of my pack. Let's see what is on this side. This is one of the side pouches. Spare knife. This is one of the BPS knives that I've been testing. It goes out as a spare knife today. Little bag of assorted cordage. It has paracord, it has wire, it has bank line, two different size bank lines. That goes in every time I go out. If I have a project in mind, I may even take extra stuff with me. Now, okay, this set of clippers is not a necessary. It was just something I was bringing out to try something, a little project out with. And there's my headlamp. That's the, the Brynite headlamp that I reviewed re, uh, recently. It actually is a great one for dropping in a bag like that. Okay, those are what's on the side pockets. Inside, my Silky Gone Boy. You know, I probably didn't need this today. It wasn't my intent to uh, do things that required a saw, but I decided to take a saw with me because I so much enjoy using them and they come in handy and it did. It came in handy, as I mentioned earlier in, in the video, where I had some windfalls down across my trail that I couldn't get around and I was able to clear the trail with my saw. 
office or anything else that's absolutely safety related. Cell phone, I did mention that, right? Um, sunglasses, do I consider that safety related? Maybe, you know, rather than tiring my eyes out. It's just, okay, so what's the impact if I forgot those? Not great, but it's nice to have when you, when you have them. And toiletry kit, I mentioned that as well. Cover element is what I'm wearing. Oh, glasses, where are those spare glasses? They're in one of these things. Oh, I know, they're, they're in the first aid kit. That's where I left them last time. That's where they are now. They're in the first aid kit. Okay, when you're choosing your items to take out, one of the things that can easily happen is that you choose more items to take with you than you'll probably ever need to use. And as a result, you end up being the classic bushcrafter, 50 pounds of gear that they only use two pounds of on any given day. Uh, that's not, a, not an insult to bushcrafters, I consider myself one. I tend to pack a little heavy because I tend to take things I think, well, I might need, might is the thing. So, but how do you know if you actually do need them? Let's go back to that risk assessment again. What could possibly go wrong? How serious would it be if it did go wrong? What can I do to prevent it from happening? And if I can't prevent it, what can I do to lessen the impact or mitigate the impact as it's known, mitigation? And then you have to consider if it does happen, how am I going to respond? At least having a plan in your mind, like if I get lost, this is what I'm going to do. If I hurt myself, this is what I'm going to do. And a lot of that is based, of course, on your knowledge, your skills, your experience, and don't underestimate how important your fitness is. You notice I didn't mention food at all. I didn't mention food at all. I mean, food is great to have and it can be a great morale booster, but you don't need food to survive. You carry that on your body anyway. Okay, I think I've kind of covered it. I'm sure I've left a number of things out. I'm tr trying to keep this video to a reasonable length, so I think I'll just cut it off there. But you are, well, I'll open it up to you. Um, if you have any comments or questions, or if you have any suggestions for future videos put it all in the video description below i'm going to put some information that around the risk assessment in the video description to help you if you want to do that on your own create a chart for yourself on trying to decide what you need and uh, yeah until next time get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference bye for now